All right, we're going to get uh, back to here to the message. So, just want to welcome everybody again online. I am uh, I'm really excited about this message. I don't know. I'm having a hard time, to be honest with you, telling if I'm excited because it's the Lord or because I had this incredible espresso latte for in the morning or if it's because Georgia won 10-3 yesterday over Clemson. How about them dogs? Just had to say that. But I uh, hope I didn't offend uh, any of the rivals out there. But uh, anyway, I, I'm just I'm kidding a little bit. But I am, I just feel an excitement about this message. I don't think it's with the espresso or because Georgia won last night. I really do think the Holy Spirit is, is, has put a message on my heart that I'm asking God to give me grace to communicate. So if you have your notes, looking on page one, is we have been talking over several weeks. We've been looking at, uh, we, we looked at our mission. And if you get nothing else out of this message, I want you to grab a hold of the mission God has given us. It is a mission straight from the Lord to make ready the bride for Jesus Christ. I can't think of a more noble, honorable mission than that, is that Jesus Christ would have a bride who has been made ready. And our mission as a church, as a ministry, is to make the bride ready. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad some one person here is awake today. Did y'all not look? I only have five hours of sleep, but I'm full of energy. Come on, y'all need to wake up a little bit. You need to wake up a little bit. You acting like you slept, you woke or you stayed up late watching a football game. Most of you didn't. Come on. Let's wake up. Y'all are, y'all are sound asleep today. Let's hear some amens. Our mission, that was fake. Our mission is to make ready the bride of Jesus Christ. In the nations, that is our mission, to be ready and to make others ready. I believe it is so in the heart of God, uh, so close to the heart of God, this mission God has given us, and he has prepared us for such a time as this. And, you know, in, in that message we look at, 12 different things that the bride will look like when she's made ready. I'm not going to rehash those here, but I would encourage you, listen to the message again, read the notes. Those 12 things we want to give ourselves to, that we would be a people of first love. We would be a people of passion. We would be a people burning with the fire of God. We would be a people who overcome Jezebel. We would be a people who are not apathetic, who are wide awake, who are looking as wise virgins for the coming of the bridegroom. And so that was one of the messages we looked at. The second message was focused on the movement. There is a present day movement of the Holy Spirit that has been released all around the world where God is raising up in this hour and commissioning in this hour messengers, forerunners, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, like John the Baptist, to make ready the way of the Lord and to make his path straight. God is raising up forerunner messengers to, re- to prepare God's people in the nations. And he's released a movement, and these forerunners will be released in the spirit and the power of Elijah, and they will trigger the, the remnant in the church to make themselves ready in the hour of history we live in. We are living at the end of the age. We need to wake up. A lot of us are sound asleep to the reality that we're living at the end of the age. We are living literally when the prophetic scriptures are unfolding before our eyes and we're sound asleep to that reality. Forerunner messengers awaken the church to the reality of the hour that we are living in. And they trigger a remnant in the church who will make themselves ready as the bride of Jesus Christ. That's the movement. That is the present day movement of the Holy Spirit that has been released to trigger an awakening in the bride to make themselves ready. And we looked at, in particular, we looked at um, Peter, where Peter said, to look for and to hasten the coming of the day of God. 
I've got to say that when I read that scripture a couple weeks ago, and I read it on purpose wrong, I had a great joy seeing everyone look at that and just trying to figure out, okay, what's he saying? What's he saying? I don't read that in my Bible. It was actually pretty fun. But God has called us to hasten his coming. That means God in his sovereignty will not fulfill prophetic scriptures alone. The church has a role to play to trigger the events of the second coming. The church has a role to play to hasten and to accelerate that day. And that's what we looked at in the movement. In the movement. You, listen, just see yourself for a second. Just get out of your boring, mundane life for a second and realize God has appointed you and me to literally hasten that day. You are a catalyst of his second coming. You are invited to be a catalyst. Amen. Amen. Then dad talked about the commission. Is not only do we have a mission, not only do we have a present day movement of the Holy Spirit, but there is a commission. God is calling us, God's calling his church to the great commission. And the great commission is more than evangelism. The great commission involves us taking what God has taught us and teaching the nation so they would be made ready. And God is calling us specifically to continue the work we're doing in southern and eastern Africa, We've, where we have trained over 5,000 pastors and impacted over 250,000 uh, believers, that that would multiply and go to an entire new, entirely new level because it has to multiply. What we're talking about in this move of God is so massive. Don't just look at you and your little world and this little church and this little thing and think this tiny thing's tiny. No, it's massive what God's doing, though it may not always be visible to the human eye. Because when something is being born, it's hidden. And when something is going to be birthed, it's hidden. The human eye does not readily see it, but the spiritual eye does. We need to peer into the spirit and fill the heart of God of what he's doing in this hour. He wants the nations as his inheritance. We cannot be only locally focused, me and you, us, me and Jesus. God is interested in the nations. I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Jesus is going to have an inheritance in the nations. And if we're going to be connected to God's heart, we can't just be American Christians only focused on American Christianity. The, the kingdom of God is way bigger than just us in, the, in our American version of Christianity. It is global, it's mission-oriented, and God wants us focused on the nations to reach them and see them made ready as the bride. Now, in this message, I'm going to talk about the trigger, triggering the second coming of Christ. Do you, do you realize Jesus is not going to just return in his sovereignty alone? It's not like we've been taught where God's got this prophetic calendar laid out and he's going to come on this specific date. No, he's going to come when the bride has made herself ready. When the bride, and I'm going to show you this in scripture over the next several weeks, when the bride has made herself ready, it will trigger the events of the second coming. And so in this week's message and the next week's message, I'm going to explain, I'm on page one, uh, item number B, point B, we're going to, I'm going to explain what it means to trigger the second coming of Jesus Christ by the bride making herself ready. As I'm going to talk about, there are three phases of the bride being ready, and each phase will trigger the next phase, ultimately leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it, this is something that most of the church does not understand, but I'm telling you, it is vital that we understand it. Proverbs 4, 7 says, 
and all you're getting, get understanding. How desperately we need understanding in this hour. It talked about the days of Noah, that those living in the days of Noah, it says they did not understand until the flood came and they took them all the way. Oh, do we need prophetic people in the body of Christ in this hour that have understanding of what God's scripture said is, says is going to take place. The bride being made ready in three phases. See, this is critical to our mission to see the bride made ready. That's why I'm going to unpack this over the next several weeks. But we are called to trigger that. We're called to pull the trigger. God's overcomers are meant to pull the trigger, so to speak, to initiate the events leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about that over the next several weeks, that at the end of the age, God, I believe this present day movement of the Holy Spirit is meant to raise up a remnant within the church called God's overcomers who would fully obey the words of Jesus and through their obedience and through their prayers would initiate the second coming. You're called to do that. I am called to do that. We together are called to do that. This is far bigger than just coming to church and listening to a message. This is a global, heavenly, prophetic, spirit of God movement being released across generations, across the nations to raise up a, a group of overcomers that would trigger the events leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Anyone there? I love preaching on Labor Day. I love preaching after, after our local team has played a night game because everyone's like, ugh. What God is doing is incredible. It's incredible. You see yourself, see yourself as part of this movement that will literally bring the king back to the earth if we respond correctly. See, this is why this is important for us. And I'm going to explain in, in, in throughout this message in more detail, teaching as well. But as forerunners, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, this is such an important part of our calling. We are called to, tr to be a trigger that makes the bride ready in this community, in the nation, and in the nations. That, and that, that bride being made ready, at least in remnant portion, would then trigger the events leading to the second coming of Jesus. That is a major part of what we're called to do. And that comes out of us locally as a community in a corporate way, owning and living the message God is giving us. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail, but obeying the words of Jesus in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3, that he gave to the seven churches. So if you have your notes, look at page, page two. The bride is made ready in three phases. Now I'm going to, again, this is a lot of information, but it's very, very important. Very, very important that we understand how the bride is made ready. Because we are the ones, among a lot of others as well, who, are, who God wants to raise up to trigger this and to see it happen is God, number one, raises up forerunners. These are individual and corporate vessels. We are meant to be at Restoration Life, not just an individual vessel, but a corporate vessel that helps trigger this by our own life and living in obedience, by our, own, by our prayers being a, a people who would pray and labor to give birth to the bride being made ready in the nations, that we would be forerunners who would, who would make themselves ready 
It's very important that we make ourselves ready. This whole calling that God has given to us, we cannot make others ready if we're not making ourselves ready. God's, got a, God's had a forerunner call on us since 1996, but it's not just for one or two. It is a corporate calling God has given to us. And, and so this only functions if we individually make ourselves ready. And as living stones fit together, we then as a corporate people, we make the church ready in the nations. How many of you realize that the church desperately needs to be made ready? Desperately. So that's the first phase. The second phase is what I call the birth of the man-child, and I'm talking about from Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. In fact, let's go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to spend, we're going to spend some time over the next several weeks looking at Revelation 12. A very, I, I would even say this, Revelation 12 through 14 is a, is a passage of Scripture that I believe in my heart after studying end-time prophecy for many years I would say Revelation 12 through 14 is the most important unfulfilled passage of prophetic scripture in the Bible. That's my opinion. But I believe when you understand the dynamics of what it's saying and what's involved, I believe if you will pray about it, you, you might agree with that statement. But it is a, it's a very, very important passage of Scripture. It's very much neglected, very much misunderstood, very much misinterpreted, but very critical to the mission that God has to see the bride made ready. So, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 is, I won't go through the whole thing, but, it, but just to kind of summarize, a heavenly woman is pregnant and this heavenly woman, and she is clothed with the sun, and the moon is under her feet. On her head is a crown of 12 stars. And she's pregnant. And the dragon, the dragon who is Satan with seven heads and ten horns, is waiting to devour that child when that child is born. And so, but Revelation 12, 5 says, she gave birth, and I like what the King James says, to a man-child. Now, I'm going to get into next week why I don't believe that man-child is Jesus. I'll, I'll explain that next week. I believe it's talking about the church who overcomes, but she gives birth to a man-child. And I, I was thinking about this, okay, how can I best explain what a man-child is? If you, in fact, if you look up the word man-child in the dictionary, it basically means a grown man who acts like a child. But there's, there's, a, there's actually two meanings to man-child. That's the kind of the modern-day version, and that's not how I'm using it. I'm using it as this baby is born as a full-grown man. And here, here's my uh, attempt to kind of explain what I mean by the word man-child is when I was in the sixth grade, there was a, we, uh, there was a guy that transferred into our, our middle school. I'm just going to call his name Bob. Anyway, Bob was a full-grown man in the sixth grade. I, I've always been tall, and I came up to, like, Bob's chest in the sixth grade. I mean, I'm looking up at Bob, and Bob has, like, a full, I mean, literally, a full-grown beard in the sixth grade. And I, I just remember in the sixth grade, just a little locker room talk for you, in, in the sixth grade, when guys were in the sixth grade, and you're, you're hanging out with the guys in the sixth grade in the locker room, and she's like, what are you going to say? Well, you're hanging out with the guys in the locker room in the sixth grade. Every, the guys who have underarm hair feel really proud about it, and the ones who don't yet, like me, feel very insecure. But the guys who had underarm hair in the sixth grade, I mean, they're basically like, yeah, how's it going? They're like, you know, rolling their deodorant, showing their hair off to everybody. And me, I was like, I'd put on my deodorant like, you know, under my shirt, not to show my underarm, because I, I, my lack of underarm hair. But this guy had full blossom underarm hair, full beard. I mean, I came up to his chest, and I, I remember he was a full-grown man in the sixth grade. He was like six foot one in the sixth grade, and he was on our basketball team. And basically, our basketball team was undefeated. We would just throw him the ball, and he would score every time. No one could stop him because, you know, he's this full-grown man in the sixth grade. I remember in the eighth grade, I played football, and uh, just to be honest with you, I played football, 
and the only reason I played football was because I wanted to get a jersey so I could let the girls wear it on Fridays. That was the only reason I played football. And so here I am, not really wanting to be hit and not really wanting to be out there, but just wanting the jersey so I could let girls wear it. I'm here on Friday, or we're here in practice, and I have to do this drill with the guy named Bob, and it's called Oklahoma, where what would happen is one player would lay on their back over here, and the other player would lay on their back over here, and they would blow the whistle, and then you would just collide. And I remember I had to do Oklahoma with Bob, and I was like, oh, God, <laughs> I'm about to get creamed. Anyway, I, I, my dad was actually watching the practice, and he told me later, he was like, oh, God, <laughs> he's about to get creamed. Bob just basically just flattened me like a pancake, ran over me, just completely, I mean, I was just like sitting there dazed, just totally flattened me. But anyway, my point in all that, um, just to let you know, Bob, even when he graduated from high school, didn't change one bit from the sixth grade. He was still six foot one. Even In fact, even after that, he didn't even make the basketball team because everyone outgrew him, including me. Um, um, but anyway, my point is, he was a man-child. He was a full-grown man in the sixth grade. That's really what Revelation chapter 12, verse 5 is saying, that she gave birth to a man-child. She gave birth to a full-grown man. It is the thing that Paul talked about in Ephesians 4.13, a mature man. A mature man. She, the, the, and I'll explain this next week, but the, the church... The church gives birth to a full-grown man at the end of the age. It's the overcomers. It's the overcomers. It's the overcomers within God's church who overcome as Jesus listed in Revelation 2 and 3. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even unto death. And God will use this group of overcomers to initiate and trigger the events of the second coming. Now, I'm going to explain that because it's a lot. I want to recommend to everybody this book by Watchman Nee called The Glorious Church. Okay, if you're not a reader, it's, a, it's 157 pages. It's, it's really easy to read. But if you go to this church, if you call Restoration Life th your church, if you're part of our Forerunner School, if you're part of Life School, I really want to encourage everybody to read this book by Watchman Nee, The Glorious Church. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it as a PDF. In fact, in the notes there, there's a reference to the PDF version you can get for free. This book contains, Watchman Nee was a Forerunner End Time Messenger. This book contains, I believe, God's blueprint for the end of the age. I believe this book contains what God wants to do in this hour. This book contains so much of what God wants to do in our church, in our ministry, of, of what it means to see the birth of the man-child. So I want to really encourage you, okay? 157 pages. You're not a reader, okay? Just, it's easy to read. I want to encourage you, get this book and read this book. Now, I want to say, I just want to list here what Watchman Nee said in, in this book on page 87. And I'm just going to summarize just a few things. I won't quote the whole thing. But basically, Watchman Nee was saying back then, uh, he, he died in 1972, but he wrote in probably the 1940s, 30s, 40s. He said, the church basically has failed. Wouldn't you agree with that? The church, by and large, has failed. She's not become what God has wanted her to be. She's not done her work or taken up her responsibility. She's not stood in her proper position. She hasn't gained the ground God wanted to be gained. There is only, there is only a group of people left to do that work for the church and to take up the church's responsibility. This group is the overcomers. That's what God wants to give birth to is a group, this corporate group of overcomers. What they do is counted as the work of the whole church. If there are those who will be the overcomers, God's purpose is attained and he is satisfied. This, it, listen to this, this is the principle of the man-child. 
So what we see in Revelation 12, 5, this principle of the man-child is this corporate group of overcomers that, that, the, that is given birth to right before Jesus comes back that does the work that most of the church was meant to do but failed. Am I making sense? God wants to trigger that birth. God wants to trigger overcomers to rise up and overcome in the nations at the, at the end of the age. See, the reason, this is what he said, the reason we are considering this matter of the man-child is because in God's eternal purpose, he needs a group of overcomers. In God's eternal purpose, he needs a group of overcomers. God needs overcomers. God needs those who would overcome and do what the majority of the church has failed to do. I want to show you just a couple of scriptures here. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul's talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He's talking about strongholds. He's talking about demonic strongholds. And Paul's talking and he says in 2 Corinthians, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Verse 5, this is key right here. Or actually, verse, uh, the next verse is what I'm going to really hit at. As we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I want you to see verse 6. Paul is saying here, we are ready to punish all disobedience. Now, Paul has shifted into the, into the prophetic dimension of this scripture. He's basically looking on to the day of the Lord, and he's saying, we, the, that God is ready through a group of the church. God is ready to punish all disobedience. Listen to what he says. Whenever your obedience is complete, God is looking for obedience. God's not just looking at you and your confession, you and your words. You and what you say you believe. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. Faith without works is dead. Faith without obedience is not true saving faith. Oh, the, uh, faith, when it has borne fruit, bears the fruit of obedience. I can look at your life and I can realize by your obedience whether or not you're truly born again. Obedience testifies of the reality of saving faith. And so what Paul is saying here is he's saying, God is going to bring this thing to an end whenever our obedience is complete. Now, what does that look like? Let's look at Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans 16, verse 20 Again, he's talking here. Paul says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. This is neither this passage or the previous one is talking just about your own struggles with demons, the own, your own struggles to get free. That's not what Paul has in mind here. That God's just going to crush Satan under your feet. That's not what he has in mind. He's thinking about the end time scenario, the end time prophetic scenario at the end of the age, Revelation, which is contained in Revelation chapter 12, the God, is the God of peace is going to crush Satan under our feet. Now, like Watchman Nee was saying, most of the church has failed. Most of the church has failed. Most of the church is living in compromise. Most of the church is asleep. Most of the church is living like a foolish virgin. Most of the church has left her first love. So much of the church is entangled in Jezebel 
And God is raising up overcomers who overcome what Jesus said in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. And these who become this man-child that's born at the end of the age, these are going to be used along with those in heaven to bring this victory of the cross, bring it to complete and final enforcement at the end of the age, Revelation chapter 12. I would strongly encourage you, here's your homework, to read Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 and Revelation 12 through 14. Very, very, very important passages of Scripture. But God is going to use the overcomers to bring about the enforcement of the victory of God, the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ upon Satan at the end of the age. And he's invited you and he's invited me to be part of that group. Okay, y'all don't sound too excited about being part of that group. I'm excited. I am very excited about that. It is going to be awesome. Now, I hope you get excited because you're going to have to do something if you want to be part of it. You can't just coast in lethargically and say, okay, I'm just going to be one of these overcomers. No, it's going to require everything about your life. It's going to cost you everything. If you just have a half-hearted, lukewarm response, you'll never be counted among God's overcomers. Ever. God would confront the lukewarmness in our hearts to say, I'm satisfied with where I'm at right now in God. May God confront that self-satisfaction that lukewarmness. Listen, Jesus said, if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. That should put the fear of God in us. That should put the trembling of God inside of us. If you're lukewarm, Jesus said, I will vomit you. I will vomit you. I will spit you out of my mouth. God forbid that there would be any lukewarmness in me. Search your heart, friends. Search your heart, friends. Beloved, search your heart for any lukewarmness that would fall away from God and self-satisfaction. May God raise up overcomers that love God more than they love themselves and their own comfortable life. Amen? Amen. May God raise up overcomers who say, I am laying it down for the sake of the cross. I am laying it down for Jesus Christ. He's my Lord. I live for him. I live by him. May God raise up those overcomers and confront the lukewarmness in our hearts and break and smash the stronghold of lukewarmness in us. The apathy and the complacency that has gripped the church of Jesus Christ in this hour. I heard a testimony recently of a, of a person who was, who, who was born again in a, in a Muslim country. I'm going to say probably... I'm not going to say the country, but it's a very much a Muslim country under severe Islamic uh, Sharia law. She got married. She moved to America. She had the best life with her, with her husband, and she, was, she had all this money, and they had all this incredible house, and they were so blessed. And she's like, I've got to go back to the Middle East. And he, the husband's like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? You've got everything. You've got money and you've got all this prosperity and you've got all these blessings. Why would you do that? Why would you move back to the Middle East where you could be martyred? And she said, because in the Western world, Satan is playing a lullaby, a lullaby to the Western church. And he's put the church sound asleep and I feel like I'm compromising my life in God by staying in America and being put to sleep by Satan's lullaby may God wake us up may God wake us up to the urgency of the hour 
Friends, I'm telling you, I'm telling you we're living at the end of the age. This is not 2019. Stop trying to go back to 2019. We have crossed a line in the spirit. The hour is urgent. The hour is urgent. So God wants to raise up overcomers. See, forerunners trigger the bride being made ready. Forerunners trigger the overcomers being made ready. Forerunners trigger this in a remnant of God's people. Now, what we see in Revelation, I want you to look at your scriptures of Revelation eleven fifteen. Revelation eleven fifteen. It talks about in, a, in Revelation eleven fifteen. If you read here in Revelation 11, Revelation 11, 15 tells us, Now the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Revelation 11, 15 tells us what's going to happen. The kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That tells us what? That tells us what's going to happen. We are moving into that time when the kingdoms of this world, praise God, are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Now, flip over one chapter to Revelation chapter 12, and it tells us how the kingdom of God comes. How the kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God does not just come randomly by God releasing judgments. That's part of it. But there is a dynamic at play. There is a dynamic at work here in Revelation chapter 12. Verse, I want to show you verse 10. Just read verse, actually read verse 5. And she gave birth to a man child. And this man child is to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, I'm, going to explain, I'm going to explain next week in more detail why I don't believe this is talking about Jesus and stuff like that. But if you go through here and you go down to verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power. And the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. See, we see in the previous chapter that we see the what? The kingdom of God has come. This is what we're now seeing is how the kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God comes by the birthing of the man-child. The kingdom of God comes by the birthing of this man-child, this mature son who will rule all the nations, this birthing of the overcomers who will rule all the nations. That when this birthing takes place, then the kingdom of God, literally, literally the shift from this current church age into the kingdom age. What we're talking about this is what I want us to get our minds around, our, our, our hearts and our minds around. God wants to bring this age to a close. God wants the kingdom of God to come. And I don't mean in the little measure we have now, though we appreciate the little measure we have. God wants to bring the kingdom of God to the earth in fullness with his son Jesus coming as king and reigning from Jerusalem. We should want that too. God, I believe, is, is, ha is, is done with all of the wickedness and the lawlessness and the rebellion and the murder and the lust and the perversion and all that's going on. God wants to bring this to an end, but God can't bring it to an end or won't bring it into an end until he has his overcomers. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is talking about a shift into the kingdom age from the church age we are in to the kingdom age that God wants to bring it into. Listen, this is a massive move 
of the Holy Spirit. You're invited into it. I'm invited into it. Watchman Nee said that, that whenever, whenever God wants to make a dispensational move, and I'm talking dispensational move, meaning shift us from the church age to the kingdom age, that God raises up overcomers. See, what God wants to do, hidden within the, the womb of the church, God wants to raise up overcomers. Those who obey, not just read, not just agree with, not just debate what Jesus said in Revelation 2 and 3, not just study, but obey, obey, obey. See, our mental belief gets us nowhere. It's our obedience that produces fruit. Be a, don't, be a, don't be just a hearer of the word. We've got way too much hearing of the word in this house with so very little doing. God wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only and who delude themselves. If we hear... And I've seen it. I've seen it for so many years in this church. It's not just this church. It's all around. But I'm just, because I'm speaking to us, I've seen it so many times where the word of the Lord comes through whatever messenger it would be, whether it's Randall, Dad, myself, Noel, Terry, whoever. And the word of the Lord comes and we hear it and we go, Amen, and we agree with it. And we say, Yes, Lord, to it. We think then, okay, I'm doing it. And James said that's self-delusion. When you hear the word and you don't do the word, you are in delusion, deception. God wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so what God is wanting to do in the birthing of this man-child is he wants to raise up overcomers, this mature man, this mature son, not just a few here and there, but a corporate group of people, not only here at Restoration Life. This is a global movement God's raising up. It's a global movement. It's in the nations. What God wants to do is he wants to raise up these overcomers who will be the trigger that pulls the trigger and initiates the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we'll look at this next week. But this birthing of the man-child, so it's forerunners. They trigger the birthing of the man-child. This birthing of the man-child then triggers war in the heavens, the God of peace crushing Satan underneath our feet, which then triggers the events of the book of Revelation. God is wanting to raise up overcomers that will literally trigger the second coming of Jesus Christ and shift us from the church age to the kingdom age. What an honor we have to be invited into this. What an honor we have. What an honor it is to be invited into this. When this man-child is born, three and a half years before the Lord returns, then the first fruits harvest is complete. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. I would encourage you, even, in, even in, uh, on our Radical Pursuit website, I did a teaching on the 144,000, why that's not the 144,000 Jews in Revelation 7, why it's the first fruits harvest of God's people, Jew and Gentile. I would encourage you to check that out. But um, when, when, this, when the man-child is born, when the man-child is born, the first fruits harvest is completed. And when the first fruits harvest is completed, that then triggers 
the rest of the bride who is in compromise, who did not make themselves ready before, who were asleep and lethargic and lukewarm and self-satisfied and mixed in and entangled with the world, that will then cause the rest of the bride to be made ready in the last three and a half years of the age through fire. I want to show you this in Scripture. Turn to Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Daniel 12, verse 10. If you look in the context of Daniel chapter 12, verse 10, it's clearly in the context of the end times, the reign of the Antichrist. All, that, all those different scenarios are what Daniel 12 is clearly talking about. And the Lord says that in that time, many will be purged. I want you to get the word many because the man-child is going to be a remnant the man-child is going to be a remnant, a remnant in the nations that triggers the events of the second coming. But it's the bride, the many are going to be made ready once that takes place. Just for clarity, when I talk, when I, some people ask this question, they say, well, does that mean the forerunners are not part of the bride? Or does that mean the man-child is not part of the bride? No, no, all of them are part of the bride. The forerunners are part of the bride. The man-child's part of the bride. The bride is the bride. So, so it's, it's clearly all of those are part of the bride. It's just the different phases and functions that there are to see the bride made ready. But Daniel's saying here, he's talking, and he says, but many, many, the greatest number of God's people throughout history will be made ready as the bride of Jesus Christ in the last three and a half years of the age through fire. Through fire, many will be made ready. It says many will be purged. The King James Version, the New King James Version says many will be made white. Many will be refined. I just want you to just understand, it's this many, just get this word many, it's the forerunners, the forerunners trigger the birth of the man-child, the man-child triggers the, the, the bride, the many of the bride, the many in the church being made ready in the last three and a half years of the age. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked are going to act wickedly. None of the wicked are going to understand, but those who have insight will understand. So you can see here in your notes on page two, that, that chart here is you have the forerunners, the man-child, and the bride made ready. And so what God wants us to do at Restoration Life, is this making sense? Okay. What God wants us to do at Restoration Life is he wants us as forerunners to now trigger, to be part of this man-child company, whatever, however you want to phrase it, this man-child company that is formed in the hidden place, in the hidden womb of the church that is born just before the Lord returns that would trigger the rest of the bride being made ready. See, our forerunner call is to, is to see this man-child birthed. That's a, that's a big part. This is not just meant to be prophetic entertainment or prophetic discussion or prophetic debate or when we get together and talk about it. It's, it's meant to be a literal birthing that brings into a reality of the prophetic scriptures. That is what God has called us to, and many others to, by the way, to give birth to this, to, uh, this birthing, to see the sons of God, the, the, those that are so filled with the Holy Spirit, those that have no self-life in operation, those who are filled with his divine life, his divine nature, his divine attributes, those who have been brought 
to this sonship, this mature sonship, this bride made ready, a bride in love with Jesus, a bride who's overcome Jezebel, a bride who's overcome her selfish nature, a bride who has overcome lukewarmness, apathy, and self-satisfaction. The Lord is wanting to raise up that man-child that would have those, those things in advance as a corporate people in the nations that would then trigger the rest of the bride being made ready. And so Revelation 12 through 14 just details those three phases in a lot of detail. And I'm going to encourage you, read that in uh, Revelation. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Don't you love it that God never gives us a Labor Day weekend where we can just coast in spiritually lazy, that he confronts us? Isn't that good? Amen? Yep. I like that about the Lord. Revelation 1, verse 3. I want you to see this. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, talking about the book of Revelation, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Think about this. That was spoken 2,000 years ago. If the time was near then, how late is the hour we live in? And I want to awaken your heart to the urgency of the hour. But God is promising us. I, I just want to just encourage you with my heart. If you feel like you have grown stagnant in your walk with God, the Lord is showing us the remedy to that is to read the book of Revelation. And that would almost seem like a paradox. Like, okay, you're telling me I'm going to be blessed reading this controversial, crazy, seemingly crazy to the natural mind with all these symbols. It's so controversial. It's scary. It's, it's, just, it's depressing. You're telling me that if I read this book, I'm going to be blessed? And I'm saying absolutely yes. You will experience one of the greatest blessings in your life if you merely read this book, that God has promised, the Father has promised this, that if you want to be spiritually blessed, then read the book of Revelation. If you want to be spiritually blessed, then hear the book of Revelation. In fact, you know, it's become, it's called, scholars call it the book of Revelation, but it was actually in the first century called the prophecy. You know, we've, we've turned this into this book where it's, you know, scholars debated and scholars, you know, say, well, this means that and that means this. And there, there's a need for commentary on it and there's a need for teaching on it because it can be confusing. But in the first century, there was not, there was, in the first century, the first century church saw this book as a prophecy straight from heaven that they were meant to read it to hear it, and to heed it. And in the, in the 21st century, we have said, I'm going to neglect it, I'm going to shut my ears to it, and I'm not going to keep it. We don't want to touch this book. But I believe this book of Revelation was written, one of the primary reasons this book of Revelation was written was it contains within it the power to make the bride ready. If we will hear and read, especially Jesus, his words in Revelation 2 and 3, if we will read and hear and heed what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we will be blessed and we will become, that is how we are made ready, not just by reading it, not just by hearing it, but by doing it, by doing it, by doing it. See, we need to rethink the book of Revelation. 
See, in the first century, it would have been like someone like Billy Graham. I'll just pull Billy Graham. It would be like Billy Graham was caught up to heaven. And Billy Graham, you know, Billy Graham's someone that everyone in the church respected. He was kind of like John. Billy Graham in our day gets caught up to heaven and he has this incredible encounter and it's this prophecy. It's not a doctrine. It's not theology. It's not debated among scholars with all these different views and viewpoints and meanings, but he comes back shaking and trembling and he gives, Billy Graham gives it to the different messengers or he communicates it now through the internet. And he says, listen, I had this experience. I had this, these, this, this heavenly experience. This is what the Lord is speaking. This is what the Lord is saying. And then we would hear that and go, okay, we're not going to turn this into a doctrine. We're not going to turn this into theology. We're not going to turn this into this debate. Of, or we're not going to look at this as crazy. We're going to say, okay, what's the Lord speaking? What's the Lord saying in this? Because we need to hear and we need to obey. See, we need to see the book of Revelation in a new light, the book of Revelation in a new paradigm. See, I believe this man-child that's being born is a generation. It's probably transgenerational, but it's a generation of overcomers in the nations who obey Jesus' words in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. I want to challenge you not just to read and not just to hear, but to obey what Jesus spoke in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. Return to your first love. Return to your first love. Remain loyal to, the, to him, even in the face of persecution and death. Don't compromise the truth of God's revealed word. Overcome Jezebel and her influence in your life. Wherever God's given you authority, don't tolerate this spirit, Jezebel, and the woman Jezebel or the man Jezebel that's operating in your place of authority. Overcome the apathy and the complacency and the indifference. Become a wise virgin who's getting oil for their lamps and not be a foolish virgin. Get oil for your lamps and burn with a passion for Jesus. Overcome, like I hit on just earlier, that self-satisfaction, that comfort of American Christianity that would lull you to sleep by self-satisfaction and lukewarmness and burn with passion and fire for Jesus Christ like you have never before. Come into this dining, intimate relationship with Jesus where you have this communion and this dining with Jesus where you know him deeply and you know him intimately and you know him in that face-to-face -face communion of intimacy with Jesus. Just come into that. And I believe that when a generation, when a generation does what this scripture says, Revelation 1-3, that when, the, when a generation heeds that and, and does what Jesus says, that man-child in the hidden womb of the church begins to be formed when no one sees it, invisible to the natural eye, but there's a movement taking place. There is a work of God forming Christ in, in, a, in a company of people, in a company of overcomers. The sons of God, Romans chapter 8, God's forming the sons of God in the hidden womb of the church, forming Christ within the church, forming Christ within our inward man, our heart, our soul, forming Christ into our mind, our will, and our emotions. Not just me and Jesus, but a corporate company of overcomers in the nations. You're called to be this. God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving. And he's saying to his church, come into this. This is your moment and your hour. A generation has been invited into this moment, in this hour. Will you respond to that invitation to see, to become this man-child company that's birthed at the end of the age and to labor in prayer and intercession for this man-child company to be born?
God is on the move to see that this is birth. Will you join that invitation? See, we've got to see ourselves. I want you to see this for a second. Get the unbelief out of your heart, please. Because it will rise up. We are the catalyst that will literally trigger the events of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I'm not just talking about us here at Restoration Life. It is all over the world. And the remnant of his people who are responding to the call of God in this hour. You are the catalyst. Let unbelief be confronted. No, certainly not, not me. Certainly God's just going to do it in his sovereignty. I don't really have a role to play. Certainly not me with my struggles and my weaknesses. Certainly not me with my hang-ups. No, you. Me, us, the remnant in the church that responds. It's an invitation to everyone, but it's going to be only a remnant that responds. It's going to be a lot easier. Let me just say this. It will be a lot easier to respond now than it will be once this man-child is born. It will be very difficult through much fire to be made ready then. But many will be made ready. I'm saying it's much more difficult then than it is now. I'm, I'm just pleading with you, pleading with us to say yes to God in this invitation and to go wholehearted for him right now. It will be much easier now than then. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Don't just say, I'm going to neglect it. That inward preparation that is required for this birthing of the man-child, it is so, it is going to be so much easier now than then. But God is going to do it one way or the other, but it's easier, much easier right now. See yourself as the catalyst. I want you to think this seriously. God is not waving a magic wand and returning. He's coming when the man-child is born and triggers the events of the second coming. See yourself as invited to be those catalysts. And I know it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy to me talking about it. I know it, it sounds crazy, but it's true. Just, if you, if you doubt it, take it back to the Lord in prayer. Just, uh, that's my encouragement. Take this message, always be a good Berean, see it in Scripture, don't believe anything I say that's not in Scripture, see it in Scripture, pray over it, see what God speaks to you, and if God confirms it in your heart, then give your wholehearted commitment to Him. Not just a yes that we have to keep saying yes, 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 yes over and over, but in a, a, in a commitment that's followed through with obedience, the obedience of faith. Because if we don't respond with obedience, then all it is is the faith of devils. If we don't respond with the obedience of faith, then all we have is the faith of devils who hear and believe the same thing we do, but they don't obey. Is your faith like the faith of devils, or is your faith the obedience of faith? Your faith is not measured by what you confess and say you believe. Your faith is measured by the fruit that's born by obedience. If you're not obeying the Lord, you're not in the faith of the Son of God. The obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. Only seven more pages. I'm just kidding. That part is a joke.
God is raising up forerunners to make a remnant ready. In fact, if you look at Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, it says this phrase over and over about seven different times, to the angel of the church of, to the angel of the church of, if you actually look in the Greek, that word angel means messenger. In fact, when in, uh, in the Gospels, when it talks about John the Baptist as the messenger of the Lord who prepares the way of the Lord, it uses that very same Greek word in Revelation. I believe, person, many, many scholars believe this as well, that the, the best translation of this message here, of this, this scripture would be to the messenger of the church in Ephesus, to the messenger of the church in Laodicea, to the messenger of the church in Sardis or Smyrna. That I, here's, the, here's the point I'm trying to make in this time we live in. When God's messengers, and I would say God's intercessors, because you may not be necessarily a messenger, but you might be an intercessor. When, when God's messengers, when God's intercessors, which should be all of us, all of us should be intercessors, when God's messengers, when God's praying church grabs a hold of Jesus' words in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 and obeys them ourselves and calls the church to obey them if you're a messenger or intercedes for the church to obey as intercessors, then this man-child company will be formed in the womb of the church. I believe this with all my heart. I'm 49. I believe with all of my heart. I will witness, if I live to be 80, probably more, even sooner than that, but if I live to be 80, I will live to experience Revelation 12 and Revelation through 14. That's why it's so important. Much of the church just doesn't have a clue, doesn't even really want to have a clue, to be honest. They don't want to see this thing because it could disrupt their nice, comfortable American life. But I don't know about you. I hope you feel this way. I want what God wants more than what I want what I want. Please don't be this Christian who calls and says, I just want to live my nice, comfortable, American, blessed life for me, myself, and I, and my family. And I don't really care so much what God gets as long as he blesses me and I have a good American life. Let's not be that way. I want what God wants. I want what he wants. I want what he wants. He wants a bride made ready. I want to be a friend of the, uh, the, a friend of the bridegroom who is not in it for himself in the slightest. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's not about us getting what we want. It's about Jesus getting what he wants. When we recover, page 4, point D, I didn't really follow my notes too closely, but you can read them later. When the messengers to the church recover Jesus' message to the church, let me say it one more time. When the messengers to the church Recover Jesus' message to the church, Revelation 2 and 3. They will trigger a remnant to make themselves ready. And this will trigger the events leading to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to end right there. And I'm just going to say, Maranatha, Lord Jesus... The spirit and the bride say come. Amen. Just want to one more time, if you didn't hear my encouragement, really want to encourage everyone to get this book. It's a, this is a blueprint of what God wants to do in the church in this hour. Watchmany had insight beyond his days to see what God wanted to do in his church in this hour. 
Get this book. Read this book in a spirit of prayer and get this for yourself. Your homework is read this book, Revelation 2 and 3, Revelation 12 through 14. Amen. We're going to end the online portion here.